All right. Thank you, Professor Higginbotham. All right. Okay, now I'd like to introduce our final speaker of the evening, Professor Kim Whaley, who will be speaking with you as well about civil discourse. Professor Whaley teaches and writes in the areas of administrative law, federal courts, and civil procedure. Professor Whaley is the author of three books that explain complex constitutional co concepts for lay audiences, including her latest book, How to Think Like a Lawyer and Why, A Common Sense Guide to Everyday Dilemmas. She is an ABC legal con contributor and an opinion contributor to The Atlantic, Politico, The Bulwark, and the, the Hill. In addition, she appears regularly as a guest legal analyst on constitutional topics such, such as separation of powers and impeachment on CNN, MSNBC, NPR's Morning Edition, PBS New NewsHour, and Fox News. Her articles have also appeared in the Baltimore Sun, the Los Angeles Times, and NBC News Think. Prior to teaching, Professor Whaley clerked for the Honorable Char Charles R. Ritchie of the United States District Court for the District of Columbia, then practiced at the Federal Trade Commission and as an Associate Independent Counsel in the Office of the Independent Counsel, Kenneth Starr, and as an assistant U.S. attorney in the Civil Division of the Office of the United States Attorney in Washington, D.C. Professor Whaley is a graduate of Cornell University and the University of Michigan Law School. You can find her on all things social at Kim Whaley. Please welcome Professor Kim Whaley. Hi, everybody. How's everyone doing? Ready to wrap up and have a snack? in the hallway, um, tired of orientation maybe, a little nervous for Monday. I know that I'll see some of you in civil procedure. Um, but it's really, really an honor to be here to talk to you all before you start law school and kind of be the capstone speaker tonight. Uh, tough act to follow with Michael Higginbotham, although I will say the one takeaway that, that I, I, I experience on an everyday basis at these days is if you're gonna get yourself in trouble, do it for a good reason, right? Um, and it's okay to get yourself in trouble. I, I do it a lot. I have people across the political spectrum mad at me um, on a regular basis. But I, I, I started doing this because civic education is so important. And where you are right now, as Professor Higginbotham mentioned, is, is one of the most elite esteemed educational experiences that anyone has on the planet. It is such an honor to be here. Very few people have access to this education. And you're gonna hear many times between now and when you graduate um, that you are the future of this country and we need you. And I'm gonna be the first to say it, um, but probably in a little bit different way than you'll hear. We do need you and we need those whom most deeply relate to you. The kind of people who pick you up when you fall, and if they can't pick you up, they lie down and listen for a while. We all know people like that in our lives, right? It's those kinds of relationships that I want to talk to you about today and how law school and lawyering is actually about that. It's about that. Um, writer David Brooks, he writes for the New York Times, he recently wrote a piece for The Atlantic um, which asked two questions. And this is gonna get a little sad, so bear with me. Um, but as Professor Higginbotham mentioned, we're in a difficult time in our country for a lot of reasons. The first question David Brooks asked is why have Americans become so sad? Why have Americans become so sad? The percentage of Americans who answered no to the question, do you have close friends, who answered no, increased four times between 1990 and today. The number of Americans who answered the question no, answered no to the question, do you know anyone well? Does anyone know you well? 50% people said no. People who answered the, que the question, when you were in high school, did you know anyone who had, quote, persistent feelings of sadness and hopelessness? Since 2009, the answer, yes, surged from 26 to 44 percent. You've probably heard, I have four kids, four daughters, and you've probably heard over and over again, maybe you've experienced this with friends 
or loved ones, family members, people you know in the community at school. Um, psychologists have linked the increased rates of depression and suicide among our youth, not just to COVID, not just to social media, but to the fact that young people feel deprived of what's known as relatedness. What do I mean by relatedness? It's about connecting with other people through shared understandings, valuing one another, and negotiating and compromising, compromising in order to sustain important relationships in your life. So that was Brooks's first question. His second question, which is even more sobering, I think, is why have Americans become so mean? Hate crimes are the, the highest rate, the highest rate it's been in over a decade. Hospital staff are leaving the profession. I have friends in the medical community. They're leaving because of the patients have become so angry and abusive. A 2019 Pew Research survey showed that nearly half of all Republicans and Democrats agreed that people from the other political party were, quote, more immoral than other Americans, more immoral, right? This is the pathway, this is the framework that is, that is framing the world for young people right now. And so why am I talking about this as you embark on, embark on law school? Law, lawyers don't have the greatest reputation in this regard. 22% of US survey respondents found lawyers trustworthy in a 2022 survey. That's lower than the global average, and 34% found them affirmatively untrustworthy. Meanwhile, and this, this, is, this is tragic, really, the January 6th indictment just filed against the former president by grand jury under the, the leadership of special counsel Jack Smith named six unindicted co-conspirators. These are people that allegedly conspired, according to the indictment, to overthrow, overthrow and thwart a peaceful transition of presidential power in the United States. All six of them are reportedly lawyers. All six are lawyers. Sat like you are, went through law school, heard these speeches, and still allegedly engaged in one of the most serious crimes in the history of the United States. For the first time in the last few years in teaching, when I teach civil procedure, we talk about sanctions, and we talk about the ethical and legal obligation of lawyers to have facts that are demonstrably accurate and law that is actually established. Those are the two things you have to do. I have to now say it's not okay to lie and it's not okay to ignore the law, right? This is where we are. But you might say, listen, I've watched TV for many years. Lawyers are supposed to be zealous advocates. You know, arguing with a lawyer is like wrestling with a pig in mud, right? Pigs love mud and lawyers love arguments. It's, it's true. And there are many reasons pe lawyers, people go to law school. One of them has to do with the fact that it's expensive. It's hard to afford housing. It's, you know, the cost of living is going up, all these kinds of things, and it's a good income. In 1967, when surveyed, incoming college students, when they were asked, What's their primary motivation in education? 85% said it was to develop, quote, a meaningful philosophy of life. By 2015, 82% said it was to gain wealth. So once again, what could I possibly say about lawyers that would help in this, in this situation? Well, we are in a moral crisis in this country, as I said, we're debating whether facts exist and whether rules even matter. Professor Higginbotham talked about rules. We are debating whether you should follow them. As I say to people, if there aren't consequences for speeding, if there's a you know, ticket in the bushes, then you'll slow down, but there's no consequences. We all go 50 and a 35. That's where we are. That's where we are in this country. You will learn, as I said, it's an extraordinary privilege to be here. And it's your obligation, starting today, to uphold the highest ideals of the profession in your work and in your life, and in your life. I agree with Professor Higginbotham 
If you're going to get in trouble, do it for a good reason, but do it respectfully and civilly. There are ways to do it and ways not to do it. Now, you might have heard of the TV show Better Call Saul. Anyone heard of that, right? It's a great show, everybody loves it. Saul Goodman's an attorney for chemist turned meth dealer, Walter White from Breaking Bad, and he becomes involved in the criminal world. And you might have heard of the show Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso. Anyway, Ted Lasso is a, co is a, is a coach, a soccer coach that moves to England, and he's a sports team coach. I'm here to tell you that being a good lawyer has a lot more to do with Ted Lasso than with Better Call Saul, even though it's about a lawyer. As I said, Ted Lasso was a soccer coach. And what's a coach supposed to do? A coach is supposed to make sure their team wins, right? Fans really care about it. Winning is everything. We talked about Oxford versus Cambridge. It's really, really important. Ted Lasso does it a little bit differently, right? His brand of coaching is not about a team mentality. It's not about winning at all costs. His motto is something like, be curious, not judgmental. He's humble, he listens, he's honest, he's trustworthy. He doesn't hard, uh, sidestep the hard stuff. And when people get mad at him, or he, he takes it with some grace. And let me say, people love Ted Lasso. People want that, right, in our country. They want that, that, that image of what it is to be human. These, again, are precisely the kinds of skills that make the difference between a good lawyer and a mediocre lawyer. Students come to law school, and this might be you, it, it happens every fall, and we'll talk about this in CivPro on Monday, for those of you who have me, thinking that their job is to find the correct answer to a problem, right? What's the answer? And you, you all got here because you're very good at answering that. You got good grades, did well in the LSAT. And then you find the answer and you vigorously argue for it. But actually, the skill of a lawyer, and this will take weeks, the skill of the lawyer is not to look for answers, but to look for questions. To look for questions. And it's very hard for first years, I found over the, over the years, to really grasp that. There aren't easy answers. If there were easy answers, you could Google it, and no one's going to pay you, like 500 bucks an hour, or whatever it is in Washington, right? They could just Google it. But making arguments is really different from identifying them in the first place. As I said, looking for the questions. Lawyers look for questions. And let me offer four things uh, that good lawyers do that I think we can all learn from. And I, these, I've compiled this list in, in, in consultation with a number of colleagues here um, that I've interviewed for various reasons around, including the dean, around uh, lawyering and, and the, the craft of lawyering and constitutional law and all these things. Number one, good lawyers are trained to identify and exhaust all the arguments, not just the arguments for your side. They want to win for their client, but in order to win, you have to exhaust the other side's arguments too. You have to know the other side's arguments as well as your client's arguments. Now imagine a world in which instead of digging into our side when you hear someone that offends you or you disagree with, our first instinct was to inset, instead to assume that person is a good person. That person's a really good lawyer like lawyers do. One who has integrity and judgment and life experience that might be different from ours, might disagree with my point of view, but I'm gonna start from the premise that they're decent people and they have reasons for where they're coming from. Imagine a world that we took every challenged, difficult conversation and we, we approached it from that premise like lawyers do. Number two, lawyers have to take into account a value system. In law school, you're gonna hear uh, professors, judges, when you read opinions, talk about policy. 
What that means, it's the rationale for having a law. Why do you have a speed limit? Because you don't want people blowing through stop signs or running over the dog, right? Because we, we value order in how we drive around the street. Every law has a rationale behind it. And there's, we call it policy, but there's actually a value system. It has to do with something that we care about in having an ordered society. Lawyers are sophisticated thinkers, but at our best, we're pragmatic, we're reasonable, we're tolerant, and we can justify the normative reasons for our position. Why this is good, not just for my client, but for the law overall. Imagine a world again in which human values took center stage in working through our differences. Human values that we all share. Tolerance, respect, humility, civility, knowledge, patience, all these things that maybe our grandparents, my grandparents, didn't have seventh grade educations. I learned this from them. Thinking like a lawyer is thinking like a human being with common sense and integrity. That's what a good lawyer does, because they have to understand the policy rationales behind the laws that, that they're advocating for on behalf of their client. Three, lawyers have to, res a right, they have a right to demand respect from an opponent in court, in writing, in, in sitting across the table in a negotiation or in a deposition, but not because they're lawyers or because they are who they are. Lawyers have a right to demand that respect because they, they earn it by, by bringing experience, deep knowledge, expertise, preparation, and mutual respect to that, to that environment. That's how they get respect from judges and other people in the profession. If you don't, lawyers who don't do it that way don't gain respect in the profession. Again, imagine a world in which people gained agency in their lives by earning others' respect in a careful and reasoned way rather than by simply tearing other people down and lodging ad hominem attacks and othering people and then drawing out differences and you know talking about their own experience of victimization. When I, when I, last summer when the Dobbs decision came out, I was actually in Bali with my daughter for her graduation. We landed. And um, in Bali, um, it's a, the island of Bali is Hindu. And they believe in karma. So the entire society is is motivated by the idea that doing good is going to be the best thing for your children and your grandchildren. That's what motivates them, it's not capitalism. It was a very, very strange dichotomy, but it really sunk in. There are ways that we can have human interactions where we're motivated by our highest ideals. Fourth, lawyers have to disagree on a Monday and work together on a Tuesday. See somebody for coffee or in the courthouse. They have to accept that they won't always win and they won't always get 100% of what they want. And even if they do win, they have to give some stuff up they care about. And you'll have to tell your clients that, right? Imagine a world in which we approached hard issues and relationships with the aim of keeping them and understanding, therefore, we can't always be right. We have to learn to, to find some middle ground and some connection, some relatedness that our youth are, are missing right now. The skills of a good lawyer offer a glimpse into a different way forward for this country, a way that centers around relatedness, mutual respect, honesty, integrity, hard work, facts, critical thinking. Recently, just this week actually, I took three of my four children to George Washington's birthplace in the northern neck of Virginia. And we went into the little gift shop. There was no one there. It was actually really beautiful if anyone wants a two hour drive. Um, it was just gorgeous. And there was a little red pamphlet in the, whatever, with all the other books that I picked up. Um, it was written by the first president of the United States, George Washington, when he was 14 years old. 
It was called the 110 Rules of Civility. George Washington, 14 years old, wrote this. They were based on maxims origin originating in the late 16th century France, and they were widely circulated during Washington's time. But as David Brooks says in his article that I mentioned, The Atlantic, it's the kind of thing we don't affirmatively teach kids anymore. We don't affirmatively teach a value system. We don't affirmatively have mismanaged you know, rules of civility. And there were a lot of problems with how that went 50 years ago, relating to race, relating to gender, relating to other kinds of hierarchies, of course. Um, but it was quite an interesting read. Uh, and Brooks argues that that's what's missing, affirmatively teaching a value system. And you're gonna learn that here. Here are a few nuggets that I pulled out of George Washington's 110 rules. If It's actually quite um, entertaining. Now, uh, first, every action done in company ought to be with some sign of respect to those that are present. This one's funny. Shake not the head, feet, or legs. Roll not the eyes. Lift not one eyebrow. Higher than the other, wry not the mouth and bedew no man's face with your spittle by approaching too near him when you speak. Do not express joy before one sick or in pain, for that contrary passion will exag exaggerate his misery. When a man does all he can, though it succeeds not well, blame not him that he did it. Use no reproachful language against anyone, neither curse nor revile. Be not hasty to believe flying reports to the disparagement of any. And lastly, of many, the one that I think resonates for this evening, associate yourself with people of good quality if you esteem your own reputation. For tis better to be alone than in bad company. Now, I remember my first year civil procedure class, Professor Kent Siverud, who's now, I think, president of Syracuse University. He asked us to take a moment and look around the classroom at people next to you, behind you, in front of you. And he said, these are your friends, your colleagues, and your professional network for the rest of your career. And it's proven true to a large degree. And so I wanna leave you with this thought. Starting tonight, show your friends and colleagues your very, very best self. Thank you. All right.